Hi, is there a new way to do statistics? Yes, there is. In this video, we'll dive into modern solutions to tackle the challenges of traditional methods. Specifically, we'll focus on practical alternatives to overcome the p-value dilemma, a topic we explored in our previous video, Is the p-value dead? We will focus on a book Introduction to New Statistics by Jeff Cumming and Robert Kelling Jakeman. The link to this book is in the video description. For sure, if you like, you can also have a look at our book Statistics Made Easy. So let's get started with a short recap. In our last video about the rise and fall of p-value, we discussed the pros and cons of using the p-value and I promised a second video about possible solutions and ways to address these issues. So what is the way out of these challenges? How can we improve the quality of our data and get more reliable insights? This is where the new statistics approach comes in. But what is the new statistics approach? According to the authors Cumming and Kelling Jakeman, the new statistics approach should be an easy and natural way of statistical analysis, which is not complicated and confusing. The aim is to move beyond traditional reliance on p-values and null hypothesis significance testing. And most importantly, the target of this new approach is to enhance the transparency and quality of scientific research. All right, but what is new about new statistics? The strategies and techniques are not new, but for many researchers it would be new to use them. And this could be a great step forward for empirical research in general. But why do the author think that the new statistics is a better solution? The authors conducted an in-depth analysis and identified three main problems that empirical research is facing today. Now we'll dive into these three main problems followed by a look at the proposed solutions and an example that brings everything together. So let's start with the first problem. Published research is a biased selection of all research. What does that mean? Why is published research biased? The idea behind that point is that not all research conducted is eventually published. So of all the research that is done, some of it is published and some is not. Okay, but why is that the problem? Why should we care? Imagine that after verifying the research has been conducted carefully and everything is accurate, the study is then randomly selected for publication. This would provide a true representation of all the research conducted. Statistically speaking, we'd have a random sample that offers an accurate picture of the entire range of studies. But unfortunately, that is not the case. One reason for this is the preference for positive results. This means that journals and researchers often prefer studies that show significant or positive results. This means if we line up research from less positive to more positive results, more studies would be published on the positive end. So studies confirming a hypothesis or showing a clear effect are more likely to be published, while studies that don't find significant results might be overlooked or rejected. Therefore, the research that does get published is not necessarily representative of all research efforts. But why is that the problem? Imagine 100 studies are conducted to test a new teaching method. Out of these, 95 studies find that the method has no significant impact on students' learning, while 5 studies find some improvement. Because journals tend to favor studies with positive results, only the 5 studies showing improvement get published. As a result, educators and policymakers might believe that this new teaching method is highly effective even though most of the research actually shows it doesn't make a significant difference. This creates a biased view and can lead to misinformed decisions in education. What about the second problem? The second problem is that data analysis and reporting are often selective and biased. This means that the way data is analyzed and reported in scientific research 
is not always neutral or comprehensive. So in the first point we say that the research that has been done is not published evenly. And in the second point we say that there is a bias within the research, that is that only certain data is published. Researchers make specific choices that can introduce bias into the results. Here we can speak of selective reporting and selective data analysis. This refers to the practice of trying different statistical analysis or data groupings until a significant result is found. Researchers might manipulate the data or test various approaches until they achieve a desired outcome that is more likely to be published. And what about selective reporting? This means that researchers and journals tend to report only results that are statistically significant, while non-significant findings are often ignored or unpublished. Let's continue with the third main problem of research today. The problem is that in many research fields, studies are rarely replicated. Replication is crucial for verifying the reliability and validity of research findings, but in many fields, it is infrequently done. Why is that the case? The reason for the lack of replication studies is the so-called novelty bias. The scientific community, e.g. journals and funding agencies, often prioritize novel and original research over replication studies. Novel findings are more likely to be published in high-impact journals, they receive more attention and they advance researchers' careers. Further, replication studies can be very complex. Some studies, especially in fields like psychology, biology or social sciences, involve complex methodologies or large data sets that can be challenging to replicate. And since time and money are limited resources when doing research, researchers might prefer to invest these resources in original research that offers more potential for recognition, funding and career advancement. So now the question is, what can we do to address these problems of research today? This is where it gets exciting. Here are four major solutions, according to Cumming and Kelling Jakeman in their books Introduction to the New Statistics. Solution 1. Complete publication for meta-analysis. The first helpful step is complete publication of research in order to enable meta-analysis. What is meta-analysis and what is complete publication? Let's start with meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is a statistical technique used to combine the results of multiple studies, addressing a common research question. By aggregating data from different studies, meta-analysis provides a more comprehensive understanding of the effect size or outcome, which helps to achieve more precise and reliable conclusions than any single study alone. Why is complete publication in this case important? Meta-analysis is only possible when all conducted research is fully reported. Therefore, to combine the results of multiple studies, it is essential to have all the key parameters from each study. Moreover, the studies must be easily accessible. Any studies that cannot be located cannot be included in the analysis. And for sure it is important to make all research findings, whether positive or negative, publicly available. Consider again our example of studies on the new teaching method, where only the five positive results were published. If we conducted a meta-analysis using only those five studies, we would naturally reach a flawed conclusion. What about the second point? Do replication studies? One single study is rarely, if ever, definitely. It always needs more evidence. This evidence can come from a close replication. Again, a replication study is a type of research that aims to reproduce the results of a previous study. By following the same methodology, procedures and data analysis techniques used in the original research. The goal of a replication study is to verify the reliability and validity of the original findings. For example, 
If a study finds that a specific drug reduces symptoms of depression, a replication study would attempt to reproduce these findings by testing the same drug under similar conditions among a new group of participants and measuring the outcomes using the same methods. The replication study's results would then be compared to the original to see if the findings hold up. And of course, the replication study can then be used in a meta-analysis. Okay, what about point three? Report effect sizes. Effect size is a measure that quantifies the magnitude of a relationship or difference between variables in a study. Unlike the p-value, which only indicates whether a result is statistically significant, the effect size provides insights into how strong or meaningful the result is. For example, when comparing two groups, there might be a statistically significant difference, but nevertheless, the difference could be so small that it has no practical relevance. When comparing two groups, the authors of the book Introduction to the New Statistics recommend using Cohen's D as an effect size which is also the most widely used measure in practice. What is Cohen's D? Cohen's D is a standardized effect size for measuring the difference between two group means. But how is Cohen's D calculated? Cohen's D is calculated by taking the difference between two means and dividing by the data standard deviation. Let's look at an example. We conduct a study to test the effectiveness of a new drug designed to lower blood pressure. We have two groups. In group 1, we have 100 patients who receive a placebo and in group 2, we have 100 patients who receive the new drug. After 8 weeks of treatment, we measure the reduction in systolic blood pressure in both groups. The results are as follows. In group 1, we get a mean reduction of 2 mmHg and in group 2, the new drug, we get a mean reduction of 8 and in both groups, the standard deviation is 4. Cohen's D is calculated as follows. For M2, we insert 8 and for M1, we insert 2. Since both groups have the same standard deviation of 4, the pooled standard deviation is simply 4. So we get a Cohen's D of 1.5. Cohen proposed general guidelines for interpreting the size of D. A value of 0.2 indicates a small effect, 0.5 represents a medium effect size and 0.8 corresponds to a large effect size. These benchmarks are not strict rules but provide a rough idea of the magnitude of the effect. In our case, a Cohen's D of 1.5 indicates a very large effect size. It tells us that the mean reduction in blood pressure in the drug group is 1.5 standard deviations higher than in the placebo group. This suggests that the new drug has a substantial effect on lowering blood pressure compared to the placebo. Okay, and what about the last improvement? Solution 4. Use confidence intervals. Finally, the fourth important aspect of new statistics is using confidence intervals. If you like, we also have a detailed video on confidence intervals, but here is a brief explanation. A confidence interval is like a range that we believe will contain the true value of something we are trying to measure. Here is a simple example. You want to know the height of all professional basketball players in the US. In order to figure this out, you draw a sample. The mean of the sample is most likely different from the one of the population. Let's assume that we draw not just one, but several samples. Each sample is likely to show a different mean. Let's say we took a lot of random samples and we calculated the mean value and the confidence interval of each sample. The confidence interval can now be interpreted in the following way. If we were to take an extremely large number of random samples and construct a confidence interval for each sample, 95% of those intervals would contain the true value, while 5% would not. In other words, if we were to take 100 random samples, 
we would expect that on average 95 of the confidence intervals would contain the true value, while 5 would not. Finally, let's bring everything we've learned together and take a look at the great example from Understanding the New Statistics, also written by Jeff Cumming. Imagine there's a journal article that presents the results of two studies. The studies analyze the effectiveness of a new treatment for insomnia. Insomnia is when you have a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep. Study 1, the lucky study. Study 2, the no luck study. Both studies compared the new treatment to the traditional treatment. Presentation number 1, null hypothesis testing. Study 1 concluded that the new treatment is statistically significantly better than a traditional treatment, providing the mean, standard deviation, t-value and p-value. In contrast, study 2 found no statistically significant difference between the treatment means, also reporting the mean, standard deviation, t-value and p-value. The big question is, are the two studies giving us a consistent or inconsistent information? Is the new treatment effective? In this case, one interpretation could be, it is evident that the study 1 outcome is statistically significant at the 0.05 level, but the study 2 result is not. Therefore, the two outcomes conflict. Of course, not much has been achieved with this statement. Let's see if we can do better. Let's move on to the second method of presenting the results, confidence intervals. Now suppose the results of studies are described using confidence intervals. On the y-axis, we see the mean difference between the two treatments. More precisely, the mean of the new treatment minus the mean of the current treatment. A positive difference indicates an advantage for the new treatment. Here we see the 95% confidence interval of the lucky study with the mean difference of 3.61 and there we see the 95% confidence interval of the no luck study with the mean difference of 2.23. So we can see that we have a positive difference in both studies. The confidence interval indicates a range of values that, given the data, are plausible for the population parameter being estimated. Values outside the interval are quite implausible. We can also use confidence intervals to do a hypothesis test. If zero lies within a confidence interval, zero is a plausible value for the true effect, and so the null hypothesis is not rejected. Alternatively, if zero is outside the interval, zero is not a plausible true value and the null hypothesis is rejected. Therefore, if we use these confidence intervals for null hypothesis testing, the results match those given in the null hypothesis testing presentation. But by using the confidence intervals, we get a better visual understanding of the results. This would perhaps lead us to the second interpretation. One result is statistically significant and the other is not, but both are in the same direction. Additional research is necessary. And finally, the last way to present the results, meta-analysis. Let's assume we get to see the result of a meta-analysis of the two sets of results. Again, a meta-analysis is like a systematic way to combine the results from two or more related studies. In this figure, you can see the difference between the means for the two treatments with its 95% confidence interval. The confidence interval results from a meta-analysis of the two studies. Now that we have data from both studies, the confidence interval is getting smaller and we're getting more certainty. A positive difference indicates an advantage for the new treatment. Furthermore, the null hypothesis of no difference was rejected, the confidence interval did not include zero and we get a p-value of 0.008. The p-value for the combined results would conventionally be taken as fairly strong evidence that the new treatment is more effective. The interpretation could be as follows. 
The mean difference in both studies is quite similar and both point in the same direction. Even though one study is statistically significant and the other is not, the findings support each other. Together, they provide consistent and compelling evidence that the treatment is effective. We have three different presentations, all based on exactly the same data. Ideally, our interpretation should have been consistent across all three. However, as we've seen, the interpretations varied. Only with the final presentation using meta-analysis did we get a clear and comprehensive understanding of the results. I hope you enjoyed the video and see you soon.